This is Lisa, the paramedic. I was so incredibly nervous this morning. I'm gonna be honest. I don't think I saw a single question from medic tests or pocket prep, like the type of questions. Medic test was way over and above. I, I feel like I studied so hard and it was such a short test, so we're gonna check it out. I will edit this later, anything I can share. There's like an NDA, you know. Um, yeah, okay, we'll see how this went. I have battle-tested foolproof tips to get this test that is such a bear for everybody done efficiently, effectively, and on the first try. Vocabulary. Go through your main textbook. If there's stuff you don't know, the terms in bold in the sidebar, review them. Look them up. You don't have to spend hours on it, but look them up. Let's talk really quick. I'm sure a lot of people have about multiple choice. Um, there's always going to be two very wrong answers. I can confirm this. Two very wrong answers, like leave the patient there, call the cops. You know what I mean? Things that don't apply at all. This is probably the most important thing in the whole video. Pay attention to the words not, except, next, best, etc. in your multiple choice test. Um, that guides you to where they want you to go for the correct answer. Eliminate the two that you know are completely out of place. Then go back and figure out of the two remaining choices which most apply to what they're asking you. Here's an important one. If it's a pharmacology question and the drug you want is not there, for example, nitro, the best option might not be something you naturally think of, but it could apply. For example, um, an MI patient with a substance on board such as cocaine and there's no nitro and there's no aspirin and there's no oxygen and you're left with something like benzos, calcium channel blockers, albuterol, um, what's another one that wouldn't go at all? Mm, I don't know, Zofran, and they're not vomiting. So eliminate the two that don't belong and figure out either the best choice that's left or the least bad. So going back to pharmacology, um, learn the terminology. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? And I know a lot of people struggle with pharmacology and cardiology. Learn what a sympathomimetic is. Be able to spout off a basic one-sentence definition. Learn what a parasympatholytic is. For example, your atropine. Um, also anticholinergic. Learn what is a cholinergic. What is an anticholinergic? If you get that vocabulary down, it will save you so much stress on your test. Know the basic classes, especially of your ACLS drugs, much less the rest of your paramedic drugs no basic dosage calculation. Study the dopamine clock and at minimum the dopamine shortcut. I learned the dopamine shortcut this week. Patient weight in pounds, take the last digit and drop it, subtract two. So if the 200 pound patient, 20 minus two is 18, 18 drops a minute. This would be for five micrograms per kilogram per minute. So if it's for cardiac, that becomes 36 drops a minute. The point of this is not to do it in the field. Don't do that. You should follow your protocol, use your chart, whatever. However, for the test, you can eliminate two that are nowhere near it and you'll likely find one that's close to that number and you're solid. So it's just a shortcut to keep you on the right track. You know the difference between CHF, COPD, and pneumonia and know a cold. Just like in trauma, when they talk about tracheal deviation, which we never see in living patients, they'll talk about pink frothy sputum. Once in a while you'll see that, but that without question, should be a CHF. COPD, you'll see tripod position, person breathing. Pneumonia, they'll probably make this sputum green. I'm serious, they're trying to throw you bones here. I, for whoever wrote this, although it's a very hard test, is actually not out, to, not out to get you, at least not in 2022. What about kids in RSV and kids in croup? Clue for croup, barking cough. Um, know what to do after you use breathing treatments and it's not working. I myself can't say I saw like an albuterol and atrovent question. So maybe you've exhausted your breathing treatments, what's next? Do you have racemic epi? Do you, you know, what, what, are, what is next on your list? For nebulization, do you have epi? Um, do you have solumedrol? Is it indicated, is it not? Know those things, know what to do next if your intervention isn't working in terms of respiratory. To know how to troubleshoot a tube that's not in the right place. Is it right main stem? Deflate the cuff, pull it back, reassess. Um, anytime you move the patient, check your lung sounds, check your tube placement. Don't move the head a lot. You know, consider you want that tube to stay there. Um, when should you nasally intubate? It is a supraglottic airway, contraindicated. Um, a couple examples of that in my research were laryngeal edema, burns, and anaphylaxis, and that's because you'll still have swelling below the position of that airway, so it defeats the purpose of having it. So know the signs of anaphylaxis versus allergic reaction. Um, they will ask you questions about both. One will have more extremists. One thing I, I would look out for for anaphylaxis is they're gonna uh, dramatically exaggerate the swelling of the face, the swelling of the lips, their level of distress. Allergic reaction, you might be like talking about hives. So it shouldn't be as hard as you think to work out some of these questions because there will be blatant clues in them. 
Um, another one that was weird is know your mode of protocol for your chest pain, but also know what to do if the patient has had a stimulant or cocaine and they're experiencing chest pain. Know what to do. Think about situations where they're not giving you the option for uh, oxygen, aspirin, nitro, etc. So besides your 12 lead of the four drugs given, which ones are completely not appropriate and of the two that are remaining, for example, a benzo or a calcium channel blocker. So if you're left with a benzodiazepine or a calcium channel blocker, know which is more appropriate in a patient that's having chest pain that's also had cocaine or cocaine and albuterol, whatever kind of, you know, cocaine and 10 energy drinks, 15 rock stars, and they don't have a cardiac history. They don't have, haven't had a cabbage, haven't had a stent. The history, you know, now, granted, if they don't give you any of this, don't assume what's not there either. They're going to give you the information they want you to work with, and you should be able to make that decision only based on what's on that screen. So don't overthink it. Um, know what to do for choking. When are you going to do the high lift? With kids, back blows, chest compressions, when do you do these things? When is it appropriate to use your McGill's, right? Or suction in McGill's. Um, obviously know your ACLS algorithms, know them cold, know your pediatric ACLS, know the energy levels for PD defib versus PD, PD cardioversion, 224, 0.5 to 1, when, you know, when are you cardioverting, when are you defibbing, um, which drugs are you using, please know your OB basics, they will be there. What do you do for a prolapse cord? What do you do if it's a presenting part only, if it's breach? Learn the difference between breach and frank breach. Some of this is just vocabulary. Know the difference. This is a huge one. Placenta previa versus placenta abruptia will have hypotension, which obviously should raise your index of suspicion and make you want to move quickly. In reality, any kind of OB thing that isn't right, go to the hospital. Um, know when you should use special items such as traction splints, tourniquets, scoop stretchers, Stokes baskets, etc. Know when emergency moves are appropriate. Is the building on fire? Is there a chance of bombs or an armed person? Whatever it might be, um, you don't stay. You move the patient, but you document. Um, burns, know your Parkland formula. Know your um, severity of burns. For example, blisters making it a partial thickness burn versus superficial. Um, know that the book is still teaching some decreased sensation with partial thickness burns, no matter how they really present in real life. Because remember this, most patients don't have just one type. Know your protocol for treating these patients and managing their airway and look for those indicative signs. They talk about soot on the upper lip. That's a red flag that it's serious. Even if they say the vitals are stable, it's serious. Um, these are just a few tips as far as study material. In no way is this all inclusive. I'm sure I'm forgetting tons of stuff. Obviously, um, Know your cardiac rhythms, right? Know your blocks. Know when you should or shouldn't use atropine in the presence of cardiac, uh, in, in the presence of blocks. Um, know when can you go back with atropine if pacing doesn't work. Work. Understand basic stuff like press the sync button for cardioversion versus defib. Understand how to pace. Um, this sounds silly, but go over it because there'll be questions probably. Um, so resources, the textbook, the main textbook from class. Um, Medic Test was the best app that I used because of the National Registry Simulator. Use Pocket Prep, use Medic Test, read the rationale from anything you get wrong. A good idea is to take those quizzes, especially the shorter form ones, over and over until you get 100. I also use the Purple Kaplan Study Guide that a lot of people have and the ECC Handbook from AHA. Why? Because it had the ACLS algorithms in it. Um, the Kaplan Q Bank was cool because it went with the purple study guide from Kaplan. So anytime I miss something, I can go to that section of the book and read it. I'll be honest, those questions were the least helpful online compared to medic tests and pocket prep. I haven't used FizDAP in years and years, but I've heard good things about it. So if you have it from your school, definitely use it. Crash course book wasn't as helpful for me as it was for some others, but it's a good pharmacology review or some basics as far as algorithms, cardiac rhythms, etc. Obviously, I took notes on stuff I didn't understand or that I thought I would forget. I made flashcards. So bottom line is this, 12 years later, and 12 days and I passed it and not only did I pass it I got let out somewhere around 72 questions so there was a whole lot of anxious waiting I found out in the middle of the night that I got it um, what does this mean that whether you're somebody that's failed it before or somebody like me that's I guess technically an old head salty medic it's passable if you want to move out of state some of us like maybe you want to escape California just kidding um, you can totally do it the thing is, is you need to be organized and you need to know how the tests work once you know what you're dealing with you know how to right you know the battle you know the fight Break down those questions learn how to analyze them learn your basic skills, the stuff you should have learned in medical school anyway, and you're going to be fine. Don't panic. Don't overthink it. Learn how to tackle the mechanics of the question, how to get rid of those two choices that don't work. And then, you know, if you have the pathophys down, the pharmacology down, and you understand the words in front of you, you read the question as to what they are asking. You can be down to those last two answers and either it'll be super obvious or you can make an educated guess. Want me to cover any specific topics? Leave a comment below and leave me any questions. Take it easy. See you on the next one.